Good morning and welcome to today's session in our uh, series of Women of Significance in STEM. And today we have Dr. Munira Bano with us and we're going to have a look at uh, what is inspiring uh, Munira to do what she does and uh, to, to perhaps uncover some of her secrets for success. So uh, welcome Munira to uh, today's session. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Leah. Good morning to you. Too. Yes. So let's start with a little bit of a, um, a helicopter view of perhaps you can tell us what you do, who you do it for, and a little bit of, of what's led you to, uh, to be where you are today. So I'm a senior lecturer at Deakin University. Currently, I have a PhD in software engineering and I'm in School of IT. Uh, it's a uh, faculty of science engineering and built environment at Deakin University and I'm also a very passionate advocate for women in STEM which is in my role as one of the superstar of STEM for science and technology Australia. So I have been affiliated other than my academic work I've been affiliated with quite uh, a number of initiatives uh, for inspiring the next generation of women in STEM field. Uh, how did I Could get I? into Yes. So what has inspired? Uh, uh, yeah, please do. Uh, to be honest, it wasn't, I would say, like a very clear laid out path. I had to find it my own way through it. I was born in Pakistan, in the capital, Islamabad. But uh, my mother, who was born in the northwest of the country, in a very strong patriarch culture, and she was denied access to education, even to the school level. Uh, being born in the capital, I was lucky to be given equal access to education like my brothers. And um, I never had any female role models growing up that I could relate to in my academic journey or even for pursuing a career. So mostly I had to look up my brothers, whatever they were doing. They were older than me. I'm the youngest and the only sister. And uh, so I had to find, as a woman, I had to find my own ways in a, and uh, being comfortable growing around four brothers. I chose a male dominated field of computing. And then by the time I wanted to do a PhD, I made a decision to come to Australia and do a PhD here. And that uh, kind of defined my pathway in Australia. After PhD, I did my postdoc at University of Technology, Sydney, where, uh, and moved for career to Melbourne to get a job here first at Swinburne University and then at Deakin University. So uh, it's uh, if I knew I would end up here in Australia in this way. No, I did not. But uh, it's one step at a time. You look at the opportunities, what you stand for, how you think about those opportunities, whether you want to take it. And I did kind of find direction for life and where I am today. So what was it about computing science? There's, there's so many different fields of science. And uh, so I'm curious what drew you towards the IT side? Uh, being a child, I think the first inspiration was with my brothers playing games on computer. That's like you look at a computer and it fascinates you as a child. Uh, I think then later on, there were the one point that uh, when I wanted to study computing, I was told it's not for girls. There's no career in girls. That's back in Pakistan when I wanted to uh, pursue. And what, what year was that? Degree. What year was that roughly? 2000. <laughs> so it's not that long ago. A career in computers is not for girls. So if, even if you want to pursue a career in science in Pakistan, medically, you, uh, like naturally you are encouraged to go into medical sciences because nurturing or being a female doctor is something that's more feminine. Uh, but uh, being in computing fields or engineering or IT, that's taken as more, I would say, masculine fields and not considered something that a woman should be pursuing uh, those degrees. And uh, I, just like I said that I had, been more the only people I was looking up to were my brothers. They had no restrictions of gender when they were choosing their field. Uh, I in the end decided that I will go into computing. It uh, the inspiration was not just uh, about the stereotype breaking the stereotype, but also 
it offers much more to your imagination, the creativity inside the world of computing where you can solve the real world problems by providing IT solution. I mean, even 20 years ago, we were watching the, the world being revolutionized in ways that we had never seen before. And currently now, if we think about the pandemic, uh, what makes it different than historical pandemic is this IT infrastructure that enabled us to stay connected and sustain some of the businesses. The education was still going on for all the universities. Without IT, this would not have been possible. So how much impact it's creating on society. And we cannot just leave women behind in all this uh, design of IT. We need more women. If this is going to be the future of the world, then we need more women engineers and IT specialists to provide solutions for the problem that are specific to our gender. Yes, there's a, there's a lot more um, light being shone on, the, on how vital it is, particularly when we're talking about biases and all of that. If we don't have the women in the design room, we're just going to recreate even bigger biases and bigger, um, you know, bigger divides um, mm -hmm. if we don't. Uh, have that balance. And you're right, in, in medicine, my daughter's actually doing um, third year medicine here in Sydney. And um, she, and, and that is a, a roughly 50-50 male, female, you know, and even we're seeing more women go into um, specialties as well. So the, the balance you know, is is um, is is starting to change. But I'm curious too, in terms of you know, when you say the big problems of the world and and the the um, the challenge of of solving them together with technology. Do you have a particular vision or particular area of which types of problems in the world that you want to solve? So my uh, current uh, focus of research is about the biases in the data and that data, how it impacts artificial intelligence. So you were talking about the biases in the design that comes later. First is that even if the design is you know, fair, even if the algorithm is fair, if the data you give to that algorithm is corrupt, uh, it has uh, gender data gaps, data usually comes from historical records and history had racism, sexism, you name anything, and that was there. If we feed the same data and give them computational powers, we can see that we are just repeating the history with that data in the age of computing. So that's where my focus is currently because that's a battlefield where we don't have enough women or enough people coming from diverse backgrounds who can, and it's not that the people who are there may have the bad intentions. It's just that they don't have the perspective that comes from diversity in the room. So we need people to focus on the data. We don't want to repeat the same bad decisions previously in job promotions, uh, in banking and loan uh, disbursements, uh, it could be the criminal justice system, the defense sector. If we use the data sets without putting them through some fairness testing, then we don't get the results that we intend for the 50-50 gender or the cultural diversity, all the initiatives that we are looking for. So this battlefield inside the world of computing, inside the code, the data, that's going to be the future battlefields. And that's where I want to focus on as well. Wow. I mean, so, but if you don't have that diversity in the, in the historic data, how do you fix that? Or is that, is that where the... We need conscious efforts. We need people in the room who can relate to it and tell them, no, this is not correct. Uh, like for if I am, I have certain privileges, I may overlook disadvantages of other people, which is a natural thing. But if we have people in the room who can recognize it and tell to me that okay, this is wrong, this is how it used to be, uh, I should be there to accept their point of view that we need some fairness testing on the data. We can't just pick up this data and train our AI algorithms to make decisions for us. Uh, decision making of AI and, you know, it has to be a cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural thing. We need to bring people from other disciplines as well, from ethics, from philosophy, from psychology. We can't just have the computer scientists and the software engineers in the room and 
I mean, they will have a very, very uh, narrow one sided focus on how the data should be there or the rules should be there for AI to make decision. Decision making has always been a very complicated thing, even for humans, let alone that we are teaching a computer how to make decisions for us. So when we say for us, who are the people we are involving in? Yes, and, and this also, you know, takes me, you know, to my, my own background, you know, way before um, uh, year 2000 in, uh, in, in medical science and how we operated in such silos. And today, mm -hmm. and again, we are so much more comfortable with people like us around us. So what I'm hearing you're saying is that to really make a difference in the future, we need that diversity from from day one, from the beginning. And so, what what are the what are the challenges that you're facing to to achieve that? For me, like you know, now this is uh, the amount of data at the moment and how much of it is available. Like, if we, I had just a project with Twitter, and uh, we have even though Twitter is free for the users, but when as a researcher, I want the data, I have to pay for it. So the resources that uh, I would have to invest in the efficient algorithms that we need. So there is so much data that at the moment in brilliance of rights we create and how to manage all of that. Um, of course, we need larger teams, larger organizations that get together. It's not a job for one person to handle all of that. Um, and also the fact that with the social media platforms, everyone has a voice now and uh, majority of them are noisy people. A lot of people who are just quiet, they don't talk much, but this is what we are uh, going to the future, the, in future, when they are going to look back on the history, it will be in the digital form, what tweets we have left behind, what we have posted on Facebook or other social media platforms. This is creating our digital identities for the futures. And let's say the archeologist of the future looking back on our social media profiles, uh, uh, social media profiles do not reflect who we are 100%. We only you know, put some certain contents out there what kind of image we are leaving behind. And I always say in past, if the history was written by the victors in future, it will be written by those who are noisy online. You're absolutely right. And typically they are not your STEM folk, are not typically the noisy ones. You know, again, that's a very broad generalization, I know. But, but that, that is, it's the technical versus the sales department or the, um, the extrovert versus, I don't like labeling people either, but I guess this is why programs like Superstars of STEM and, um, and then individuals like yourself, who, where you bring a lot of those communication skills with you. So you're, you're honing them to get even more effective, to be able to be heard and to be able to cut through the noise and to know what to ask for, for support. Because so if we don't, media, yeah. Social media platforms are amazing tools if used by people consciously. Uh, but at the moment, if we shy away from criticism, I mean, if I would post something controversial as a woman, there is a very big chance that I'm going to get told off by many keyboard ninjas somewhere sitting in the world to put me back, you know, into the shadows. Uh, if we surrender to that, then we let these people win. And uh, there was a project, uh, one of my team of my students, they conducted on the level of sexism, racism, and uh, faith-based hate uh, on social media. They took Twitter as uh, a case study. And uh, majority of the hate speech that was coming on social media is in the form of humor. Uh, which we consider sarcasm. harmless, yeah, sarcasm, humor, we think it's harmless. But the thing was that when it was fed to the AI, AI algorithm was not discriminating between humor or non-humorous data. Uh, AI still has not been able to detect sarcasm or jokes. So whatever we were feeding to it was like, you know, if we say 90% was humor and 10% was actual hate speech uh, among the detected for AI algorithm, it was all hate speech. So we have to be, we are going to be responsible for what we are putting out there. Every tweet, every post, the content that we are generating is going to stay there and we are contributing to whatever 
is going to be the future based on our contents. Yes, yeah, certainly, um, you know, the, the content production, I don't know what the statistics are now, but all the recommendations are that you need to be putting out your content so that people know what you stand for and, and that, you know, you're carving your, um, your, your niche in, in the world, in the, like, as you say, in, in the social media platforms. I guess if you were um, looking at something that you have now that you wish you had, say, even 10 years ago, what might that be that would have helped you so much more? Um, because it sounds like you have been such a trailblazer already in so many ways. Munira, and, uh, and that you are such a wonderful role model for those that you're teaching and, 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 and coming after you. But what would be, say, the top two or three skills or uh, teachings um, that you feel if you had have had those 10 years ago, you could have been so much more further ahead? One thing at top of my head that I can immediately tell you was that uh, if I knew it before, uh, that I learned from my experiences that it was always the journey that mattered more than the destination. Uh, everything that I was aiming for, the hard work, the planning, it was the actual work that I was doing in order to get to my goal. That was more, I would say, important and critical than the goal itself. So and what did that give you? What did that give you, that journey experience? All the growing, learning, the building of my resilience, uh, all of that came from the struggle uh, and the journey. So for example, coming to Australia, making a decision to come on my own here, dealing with the cultural shock, the, I would say the homesickness and still navigating the academia here in a very different cultural setup. Uh, towards the end, I did get the PhD, but it was those years that I was aiming to get my PhD were transformational and uh, they, helped me become more empowered and the person that I am today. In the end, I did get a PhD, but I think the journey was worth it. And uh, if I knew that how much I will be in love with the time that I was pursuing PhD rather than the graduation itself, I think I would have been much relaxed and have been less, less anxious about the successful outcome. So we focus more on whether we are going to be successful or we are going to be failure. Guys, of outcome, I would have been the person I was through my journey. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point, isn't it? Because, you know, we are measured on those outcomes mm. and there are, you know, and, and, the, and our own uh, sense of how we measure success and failure. It's often only looking in the rear view mirror that we can appreciate the journey. Yes, it's um, the words I came to know that, and I hope I knew it all along. Uh, I would yeah. have been much more focused on the time that was I was spending during the, on the journey towards my PhD. And so, how what kept you going on that journey? Was it that you committed to to completing it, and therefore you were going to complete it, or was it the the longer term vision around what that would enable you to do? I always term my PhD as my concrete ceiling. I know you, the term in Australia was the glass ceiling. And the first time I heard about it and I was like, no, I don't have a glass ceiling. My ceiling was made of concrete. Uh, none of the women in our family had the opportunity to school education, let alone to travel abroad alone and uh, pursue a PhD. And for me, this was a sense of purpose that you know, I have to be a successful case to show that, yes, I'm the first one to break the concrete ceiling for all the women in our part of the world, that it's not impossible. You can do it. Okay, it takes a lot of resilience and hard work, but not impossible. So you mentioned when you were younger that you didn't have those role models, as you say, in your family and the culture, all of that. Once you came here, you know, were you still just as uh, self-efficient or, you know, were there mentors or, you know, what, who, wh how did you, uh, like, how did the environment support you? So I came to UTS and I think the biggest thing that I would be, 
grateful for at UTS was um, my PhD supervisor, Professor Didar Zori. The first time I had a female teacher in the field of computing. And uh, she, her, she has been in Australia for a very long time, I think, but um, originally she's from Iran and we have a, some cultural, uh, I would say, values being shared. And she could understand my situation being, you know, my journey and my sense of purpose and why I was doing. And she still date after I finished my PhD, she's still my lifelong mentor in Australia. So I think having a female PhD supervisor helped a lot someone who was in the field uh, i didn't know much about australia i would not have been able to navigate uh, academia here as uh, easily as i mean she made it easier for me to tell me how to yes and you mentioned the shared values hmm. and the shared cultural um you know background so on on the value because there's a lot more focus now uh, on hiring on values first mm. skills second so mm. I'd love to hear how you what what would your top three values be now uh, in terms of where I am or throughout my life or your personal like when you when you took when you um, the perhaps even the shared values that you recognize mm -hmm. with your PhD supervisor the things that speak to your uh, heart I can relate to both of them. First, my personal one, I think throughout my life, if I look back, uh, and the reason I know them because we have been through some of the workshops about self uh, <laughs> and knowing ourselves. Uh, so the first one was that I took risks and I was fearless when I was taking risks. Um, where I wasn't too much focused at that time. Okay, if I fail, I fail, but I have to take the risk. I may never know, I may succeed as well. Second was once I made the decision, I was resilient about the decision, no matter how hard it looked like at the moment. And third ah, would be- So I'm, I'm hearing commitment. Like uh, when you make a decision to something that's important to you, you stay committed, no matter how many knocks and and uh and setbacks you have so the resilience builds but the key is Manira, you stayed committed to that decision yes i was and the third one i would say that i worked really hard as well it's not just that yeah. you mentally stayed committed you have to actually do things which may require that sometimes i was working on weekends as well sometimes i was working all night as well so there's a lot of hard work, which may not be visible on the surface, but when you achieve something, that's all that is in the background, that uh, pain and uh, you know, sacrifices that you make to get there. So these, uh, I think there are the personal one with her, my shared values were, uh, most of them were cultural, like she as a woman understood that what kind of cultural background I was coming from, uh, some of the things that are not very explicit but i would say implicit in nature in your cultural values like for example coming to australia i was initially shy to be around uh, people who were from different cultures not not because i didn't want to but because you don't understand some of the things uh, in a gathering with humor so she realized it on, on her own some people would think that you know i'm I wasn't communicating, I wasn't uh, very friendly enough, but uh, she realized that it's just the shyness that was part of not knowing other people who are from other cultures. So he used to take me with her to different uh, gatherings. Then we travel to international conferences. We have a cultural background when there is a senior professor. It's a sign of respect that you stand quietly there, but she would push me to talk to them because she knew that I come from a different cultural background. It's not that I was afraid of talking to them, but it was my uh, understanding that it's a sign of respect that you let the elders talk. But she would say that, no, this is a different cultural paradigm and they expect you to take initiative to talk to them. So mm. I mean, these things which uh, she understood why I was behaving a certain way. But, and she helped me to understand, okay, in Australia, there, is a, there are different cultures and you, this is how you build a cultural intelligence to try to connect with different people who have different set of values. Yes, so again, that willingness to, um, to listen and to be coached. 
to, yeah, to, to be coached into trying interested. different things. Yeah. yeah, I'm interested to know because in Pakistan, I didn't have the opportunity to have that kind of multicultural environment, the one that I had at UTS. Mm. Uh, there were literally people from China, India, uh, in you know some European countries and some of the Australians who had different heritage from different parts yeah. of the world. And this was a very amazing and unique opportunity that I think I wouldn't have, uh, I, I never imagined that I would have, that within one university you would learn so much about so many different cultures. Mm. Um, and this is a, was amazing experience. So, so now that you are in a leadership role and the PhD is behind you and you are now mentoring those coming, um, you know, after you and with you, are you, um, are you experiencing, um, are others treating you differently now? Like, do you experience, is the bias, is, is the difficulty, are you still, is it still a concrete ceiling for you or, are you, or have, <laughs> um, you, have you made a little cry? <laughs> I think that because concrete ceiling is, a, we define for ourselves what our ceiling would be. Uh, for some people, it would be, I, I don't think PhD would have been a ceiling for them. Uh, but, you know, I just explained to you the cultural context that why I call it the concrete ceiling. And once yeah. that concrete ceiling is broken, you don't care about glass or bamboo or other ceilings because I think you do build the strength to they know that, okay, the others, they you can smash them as well. Uh, I am not much driven by the opinions of others. If there are someone who has any bias or something, I have learned to, you know, focus on my own goal, what I want to achieve. So, and also being in academia, academia has a, an environment of zero tolerance for racism and sexism. They have very good policies in place. So uh, I had amazing journey so far at UTS, at Swinburne University, at Deakin University. Uh, they are very much appreciative of the work that I do uh, for outreach and inspiring others. And I'm really grateful to be in a workplace that has the values that appreciate for what I stand for. So uh, I'm so pleased to hear in, that. Yeah. yeah, I'm so pleased to hear that. In academia, I haven't been, yeah. And even, you know, after, I, I know I'm not going to deny other people's experiences of racism and sexism, but uh, for me, just like I said, that I don't put too much uh, value on someone being negative towards me. I focus on my own goal as well. So there has to be some internal um, effort as well. I very proudly tell everyone I'm from Pakistan. This is my background. I have nothing to be shy of. I take pride in my origin and heritage and it, I call it my authenticity. And I think that gives you power to crush any negativity coming towards you because of your ethnicity. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of... Um, like the word or, you know, be your authentic self, bring your whole self into mm. the workplace. Um, you know, it certainly sounds to me, Munira, that you do that, that, you know, what you see is what you get is, is how I'm receiving you. Um, and you are extremely articulate and, and uh, very clear in your communication skills. Is this something that has been, learnt or were you always like this as a child? You, I guess you must have been with so many <laughs> brothers. You would have had to learn to get your message across in that family <laughs> home, I would imagine. Uh, yes, uh, I, I would say that because if my mother was not given uh, access to education, but my father was an extremely educated person, well accomplished, uh, this was the norm that men were always very highly accomplished. And he had a huge, I would say a library of, full of books, which were my initial inspiration that I would sit down and at all. So reading and you know communicating with my father in that language that I was reading in the books was the first step uh, because yeah. that would be an academic conversation that I could have was more with my father rather than my mom. Mm. Uh, secondly, uh, I am a multilingual. I speak five languages. And English was, because Pakistan was ex-British colony, we had in school, the educational system was in English. Yeah. Uh, my mother tongue is Pashto. My national language is Urdu. We were taught Arabic for religion. And uh, Persian is my language that of inheritance from the northwest of Pakistan. And English was like kind of fifth language. 
Uh, yeah. So I, when I came to Australia, I didn't have to face the barriers of uh, language because of my educational background in that language. But it was more academic in nature at that time. And also the fact that I was not um, aware of Australian uh, accent or the slangs. <laughs> uh, so streetwise, I would say it, I did struggle in the beginning as well. But compared to people like, you know, my friends coming from China or Iran who never were exposed to the language that way, they did have some difficulty in communication. Uh, becoming more articulate, uh, I think, was over the time uh, with the trainings, uh, with media trainings and you know, writing journalists and also the research training. So you do get the idea of how to convey your message concisely and in short <laughs> mm, absolutely and yes and and, and in academia teaching i think uh, designing the lectures and trying to get to the level of students uh, to make them understand uh, very complex technical terms that you want them to understand so it's i think it's practice over the period of time mm, and and yeah that that combination of nature and nurture but there's got to be that desire that's got to be there that uh, yes, some I sense see, of calling, a sense of, <laughs> yes, yes, and that you're enjoying the journey and the, the, um, the complexity of, of what you're navigating as well. And um, it so I guess... It's an important part. Uh, I mean, if, if anyone wants to stand up for something, you have to talk to people. You have to be able to make other people understand your point of view if you talked about sharing values it cannot happen without uh, meaningful conversations and communication and it is an important uh, thing uh, if i mean anyone wants to stand up for something they need to understand other people and how the selection of words and the vocabulary that would make it easier to convey mm. a message to other party Absolutely. And um, I guess we've got a couple of minutes left now. I'm curious to hear what would be your um, parting words of advice to um, you know, a young woman coming through and looking at, um, you know, what, what career path she should take and, you know, is STEM really for her? I mean, what, what are you, um, what, yeah, what words of, of encouragement or advice would you like to leave? My first uh, message always to the girls is that uh, the reason I'm standing up here and sharing my story is to tell them how privileged they are in Australia, that no one stops them from going to school. So next time they look at their school, when they go there, just appreciate of this is a privilege that you may take for granted, but think about the thousands of girls, millions of girls currently who are denied of this privilege. So education itself is a privilege and STEM education is empowerment. That's where I tell my story that if I am an empowered woman today, it is because I have a degree in engineering and IT. Uh, I so, how did, so how does that empower you? The empowerment comes from the fact that I can impact the design of the tools and the technology in the future. I can contribute to making it a fair and inclusive place for other people who will come after us. So we all have our part to play in designing our world. And having a degree in engineering and IT gives you that sense of empowerment that you can actually contribute. Yeah, I love that connection you've just made between literally the nuts and bolts of what we learn with the impact and that this this is such a powerful foundation and this is what gives decision-making substance. This is the heart of data-driven decision-making. Ev good evidence, like solid, like evidence-based decision-making. And, uh, and I think this is why we absolutely need more women to um, like yourself, Munira, who are who are taking on this challenge, and uh, and I, you know, I can see that you know the next twenty to thirty years of your life are going to leave such a a powerful and impactful uh, imprint on our world and inspire so many other women to take that risk, be braver, be bigger than they think they are, because um, you know for a, 
a lot of women, it is. It's about our own imposter mm. uh, that that stops us from even considering that, that that what I study today may just be able to make, you know, a global impact. Mm. And uh, certainly you're a shining light in this area. Thank you so much for your kind words. And regarding that imposter syndrome, I'm going to just say uh, very briefly, uh, there was this one workshop that we did uh, attend uh, about, and there were a lot of questions about women not feeling, you know, good enough. And this not feeling good enough always used, I mean, most of the time, it's about how other people perceive us rather than how we perceive ourselves. And there was a really good comment made by one of the session um, operator and he said that look towards the end of the day when you are going to bed everyone is thinking about themselves just like you are thinking about yourself so no one is thinking about you so focus on what you have to achieve and isn't that the truth you know that that really is and um and you know and when we really embody that then somehow it it, it does it just the, the shackles drop away don't they Mm -hmm. um, and another another saying that um, I learnt that has always stood me in good stead is uh, what other people think of me is none of my business. Right? Absolutely. Because, <laughs> like you say, you know, there's and the the bigger the goal, the bigger the um, the disruption, then the bigger the detractors. There will always be people like human nature is to hang on to the status quo. Right, and what you are doing is breaking those. There's a lot more concrete to come, I'm sure, <laughs> just in different in in different colours, maybe. But should have gone in civil engineering. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh, I've um, I've really appreciated your time today, Manira. And uh, where can people contact you for um, to connect with you best? Uh, yeah, I am on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, um, I'm also on Instagram. So we, as a superstar of STEM, we do have created our public profiles. So with yep. my team, I mean, people can connect with me. So I do share our work and our, any events that we are there, along with my sister superstars, we, it's what we do it on our social media channels. So that, I mean, anyone is welcome to follow. Wonderful, I will certainly, uh, be following you and supporting you uh, as much mm -hmm. as I can. And this is what we are about, is about extending and, and making people aware of the wonderful work that is being done right here uh, in Australia by um, amazing uh, scientists and, uh, and, and women of, of, of significance such as yourself, Munira. I, I really thank you for your time today. Thank you so much.